Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to the TGF for the invitation, and thank you all for joining this second session on agriculture and agri-food today. And we are happy to double down on the previous session to talk about uh, the supply chain as a whole and how innovation can help and optimize with regards to the challenge of climate change. These are truly pivotal times where the agriculture and agri-food sector is facing a number of opportunities and challenges. Just this year, Canada has faced unprecedented, unprecedented wildfires, raising temperatures, floods, drought, and extreme weather events, as well as supply chain disruptions that are threatening production levels and food security both here and abroad. We are collectively becoming more aware of the role that, that agriculture and agri-food plays in climate change, with the sector seeing a number of opportunities to reduce greenhouse gas and continue to reduce emissions. With this in mind, and I couldn't help plug some work that my department is doing. We are currently leading consultation with stakeholders towards the development of a sustainable and, agri and a sustainable agriculture strategy, which will help set a shared direction for collective action to improve environmental performance in the sector over the long term, support farmers' livelihoods, and strengthen the business vitality of the Canadian agriculture industry. Canada is guided by a vision to be recognized as a world leader in sustainable agriculture and agri-food production. It derives from a solid foundation of regional strengths and diversity in order to rise to the climate change challenge, to expand new markets and trade while meeting the expectations of consumers and to feed Canadians and the growing global population. Canada plays a leadership role in agri-tech, and here I would like to borrow some statistics from our friends from Invest in Canada by saying that Canada ranked number two in the world for the number of agri-tech investors. This prominence only emphasizes the need for further support to bolster the sector's contribution to green agri-tech, which the Government of Canada is committed to, and to that effect, AFC committed $1.5 billion over the next decade to help farmers adopt new and greener technologies and practices. So we are now joined by panelists that are at the forefront of, of efforts to advance sustainable innovation in Canada agri-food sector. Their backgrounds uniquely position them to speak to the actions needed to mobilize investments to build agri-food resiliency and how advanced technologies and innovation can be harnessed both in Canada and abroad. So I'm pleased here to be joined by Dr. Uh, Love S.A. Chile, Technical Lead and COO of Regenerative Waste Labs. We also have Craig Anna, who is a founding partner at Power Sustainable Leos. John Kazidi, Managing Director from Thrive and part of the SVG investment team. And last but not least, we have uh, Alexandra Barlow from, the, from CFIN, who will be moderating this session. So without further ado, I will turn to you, Alexandra. Thanks so much. And thank you to Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada for having us today. So fostering resilience in the supply chain is an opportunity that's impacting us every day in Canada on both a micro and macro level. Micro, we've all seen the price of our basket of groceries go up. Uh, and on a macro level, the reality is uh, food and agriculture represents about 7% of our GDP as a country and one in nine jobs. So despite how well positioned we are to feed the world, the sector does continue to struggle with some challenges, and I think our previous panel talked about a few of those. Um, you know, we see a lag in productivity and some lower than average investments in research and development and new technology, which is impacting the resilience of the supply chain and its ability to respond to domestic and global opportunities. We do have an opportunity to feed the world. So, Given sustainability is also now becoming more front of mind uh, with uh, processors and the sector itself as they face rising input challenges, um, they're also being confronted with customers and consumers who are raising their expectations around the topic of the sustainability of the food that they're consuming. Our organization, the Canadian Food Innovation Network, was actually engaged by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada uh, in late 2022 and through the last year to conduct some listening sessions with food innovators, people working at the forefront of technology in the sector, but also food processors. And we were asking them what are uh, some of the biggest barriers to the sustainability and resilience uh, of your operations. Uh, unsurprisingly, capital was probably the biggest topic. I think we could always have more cash in our pockets. Labor, 
the challenges of automation and robotics and being successful with those adoptions, and then sustainability, this looming new challenge that they're facing. Uh, on investment specifically, innovators said that they felt that venture and investment capital in Canada uh, is just generally a little more risk averse than the United States. Uh, we have a couple of members from the investment community on the panel, so perhaps they might take issue with that finding. Um, but they also indicated that post COVID, uh, the environment for raising capital um, has become extremely challenging. There were a few outliers to that statement, notably being companies who brought forward a climate tech or a sustainability element to the sector. They were finding it a little easier to get traction. Um, uh, for example, one of our members, an organization or company called Relocalize, based out of Montreal, they have hyper-local production systems, mini food factories. Uh, their first pilot is installed at Southeastern Grocer in Florida, where they're sort of autonomously manufacturing ice. Doesn't sound very sexy, but the company previously used to ship ice from Maine to Florida, and Florida's the largest consumer of ice, cubed ice. So it was a lot of food miles. They successfully just closed a $4.7 million seed round. So an interesting narrative or story around um, how sustainability is, is helping some companies gain traction in the investment and funding sector. So that's what we heard. I'll, I'll turn to each of you now and, and ask you to tell you a little, tell us a little bit about your place in the agri-food sector. And from your unique perspective, what have you seen in the last 24 months on the funding investment landscape? Has it changed for companies who are working in sustainability and food? So Craig Han, I'm one of the three partners that founded a group called Power Sustainable Leos uh, just over two years ago. So we, we have a very acute view of that time period you just described. Our, our reason for being is to provide capital and capabilities to growth stage companies across the food value chain who have a positive impact from a sustainability perspective. And we'll, we'll try and unpack that further. But for us, we are always looking for really strong businesses where there's an opportunity where the, and the growth of that company ultimately has a quantifiable and relevant impact from a sustainability perspective. And when we think about relevant, we, we mean it needs to be relevant to the customers. It needs to be relevant to the other stakeholders around that business. And that goes into our model of how we think about success and creating a virtuous sort of circle where the sustainability elements of a business can ultimately be an enabler of commercial success. And that's a huge part of the growth equation that we have a lot of conviction behind. We're a $300 million fund uh, that is part of a broader group called Power Sustainable. Power Sustainable is a new asset manager that's part of Power Corporation of Canada. Uh, that team at Power Sustainable is now about 100 people strong and represents over $2 billion worth of institutional capital from groups around the world who are all focused on sustainability challenges and, and opportunities. And our team is entirely focused on the food value chain and system. So I look forward to the uh, discussion. Thanks, Alex. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Lovisi Chile. I'm owner and operator of Regenerative Waste Labs. We're a circular bioeconomy research consulting firm with a mission to really build local resilience for the agri-food supply chain by coupling food security with sustainable production and consumption. And what that really means is supporting organic waste generators in understanding how to valorize those waste streams. And we also work with businesses who are developing bio-based materials and help them in understanding the environmental impact and performance of their products. And so we think of it as looking at two sides of the waste management coin, how organic materials can be fed into bio-based products and how bio-based products can be fed into waste streams. And so what we've really seen um, over the last couple of years is this transition towards a low carbon economy. And, but to be able to do that, we really need natural based solutions of which bio-based materials are a key opportunity there. And so we're seeing a lot of investment and innovation within new types of bio-based products, new technologies to process organic waste. And so it's been very exciting to kind of see that development over time. We've seen a lot of circular food hubs being implemented across the country 
country, often looking at directing food surplus um, into other upcycled opportunities. But there's so many uh, new avenues in which that oh, those organic waste streams can be directed to. And so we're really excited to see continued investment in that landscape. Great. Uh, my name is John Cassidy. Uh, I work for a, an organization called SVG Ventures and Thrive. First and foremost, we are a venture capital fund uh, in the food and ag tech space. We've invested in about 122 companies globally. Uh, 23 of them have been Canadian. Um, we've been doing this for about uh, 11 years and our business pr predominantly functions on four key models. So you know, the first pillar is that we're an investor. Uh, we're a very active investor and we operate at uh, late, se late seed uh, series A stage. Because we operate at a very early stage uh, in, in companies' growth, we like to have programmatic activities um, that support our investments. So we have uh, technology accelerators that are focused on scaling businesses um, in a country where 90, I think it's 98.2% of companies or 200 employees or less in Canada. A scale accelerator, I think, is, is very well needed. Um, so we support entrepreneurs through that early stage journey. Um, sitting beside that, we also have a team of corporate innovation consultants that work with um, the likes of Yamaha, Kubota, Driscoll Berries, Taylor Farms. Uh, the reason why we do that is corporates play a big role in the industry. Uh, many of the corporates that we work for, the CEOs um, are thinking about two predominant things. Number one is how do I be profitable and stay profitable? But really number two is the most important thing is how do I be sustainable? So how do I protect my organization against disruption? And the best way to do that is to be very much engaged with new technologies that are growing out of the ecosystem, hence why they work with organizations like ourselves. So more often than not, we've set uh, in between uh, different acquisitions um, or different commercial arrangements between startup scale-ups and corporates and then the fourth pillar is a pro really important for us is um, the ecosystem. I think uh, food and agriculture is a very fragmented ecosystem. Um, our CEO in the United States uh, keeps using the phrase that there aren't too many farmers hanging out in San Francisco or drinking cappuccinos. And likewise, there aren't too many technologists hanging out in farms. Um, so how do you bring that ecosystem together? So we've um, really, we try and do high profile events you mentioned that some of the, uh, your companies you're dealing with aren't sexy. So we realized the industry wasn't that sexy in 2014. And we ultimately partnered with Forbes Media. Uh, we joined, founded the Forbes Ag Tech Summit. What that allowed us to do is really position ourselves as a, as a global player, um, increase our deal flow. Um, but it also was used validation for us. That's one of the biggest media publications was really thinking about this sector. So. I'll stop there. I'm looking forward to the conversation. One of the reasons why we entered Canada uh, three years ago, um, we see Canada as a potential leader, uh, probably in both feeding and fueling the world. Um, and uh, we would like to play a role in that. And I can speak a little bit more about our, our venture capital fund and maybe tackle some of the things you said around available capital as well. Thanks, John, for uh, helping make agriculture and food sexy. I appreciate that sincerely. Um, so we, as I noted in the beginning, we've heard often capital being a major barrier on the investment side. Um, Canadian food innovation members uh, off running SMEs often also feel frustrated that there's not enough dollars out there to adopt sort of sustainable technologies that'll make their businesses more efficient. In your opinion, is capital really a problem? Is that the biggest barrier? How do we help SMEs become better ready adopters of technology, whether they're in food or agriculture? I'll happily start. We're huge believers, and there's a lot of data to back this up, that the, the food value chain as an investable area has been massively undercapitalized, underemphasized for not two years, but decades uh, as we look across North America, there's been pools of capital that perhaps have targeted very small parts of the, that value chain. And we've seen more capital around sort of early stage food tech and ag tech um, as of late, which is, is wonderful. And we've seen some capital very close to the consumer around what I would maybe air quotes, green brands and very on-trend consumer products. The 90% of the middle of the value chain has been largely underemphasized and underemphasized both from an availability of capital, but 
skilled capital, capital that can bring more than just uh, dollars and cents, but that can help unlock relationships, ecosystems, and have experience growing and scaling businesses. And, and that's a huge part of what we think is, is missing or has been historically and what we're trying to fill. Yeah, I love that uh, skilled capital term that you're using. Um, perhaps I'll go John and then Lovese, I think you have a slightly different angle on the question. I think I think right now there's probably been um, there's never been a time um, where I feel there's more availability of different types of capital. Or, or, like if you look at in Canada, there's there's sector focused VC funds, there's uh, gender focused VC funds, there's um, minority focused VC funds. So I think it's it's there's never been a time where you can actually position your business to. Um, attract investment from an investor that's actually going into into your sector or what, whatever um, and that, that might be. Working with US uh, entrepreneurs and Canadian entrepreneurs is, is often very interesting for us because um, US entrepreneurs are very much focused on on venture funding first. I would say there's a lot of there isn't as much grant funding in in, in, um, in the US as there is as there is in Canada. Um, what I feel Canada does really, really well is backing research, um, which de-risks a lot of uh, our capital. What I would say is, is that, and I'm glad innovation is a discussion, and to be critical of our industry is that we're always asking for innovation in agriculture and in food. And what I would say is there hasn't been a lot of innovation in venture capital in terms of, like we're raising a $75 million uh, fund at the moment, um, but for a big food manufacturing business, I mean, the amount we can invest doesn't really um, move the needle too much. So does venture funding actually suit that type of um, that type of business? Um, the answer is no. I mean, so is venture debt uh, uh, more a um, a route to go down? Um, so we're. <sighs> we like entrepreneurs by their very nature always say there isn't enough capital, um, and right now they're they're probably right. Um, so there's been things that we've looked for that we sometimes may not have looked for. And one of those would have been like profitability at a very earlier stage is not something we've traditionally uh, looked at as part of our internal metrics to assess an investment. Um, whereas now we do. Um, so, and also it's very difficult for, for um, complex deep tech technologies to, to, to be profitable at a very early stage. So I don't have the answer. I don't have, I think it takes a collaborative effort to, um, to get to a point where the industry is, progresses so that these companies can grow. But um, um, right now, it, it, it'll require collaboration from corporates, from governments. Um, but ultimately, I think how you position your organization and looking for capital, not just domestically, but internationally, um, you, will see, you will find more capital than there actually seems to be. Hmm. And Lovese, have you seen uh, cap, you know, as a, a consultant and, a, and an organization that's working with companies on these challenges, are you seeing them start to unlock more capital to dedicate resources and time to the sustainability challenge that you can hopefully help them solve? Yeah, I definitely think there's opportunities for innovation. As, as my fellow panelists have probably seen, there's a lot of um, technologies to process organic waste, to find opportunities for bioenergy and other types of valorization techniques. But what, I, what we really are also interested in supporting is those SMEs who are, for example, food producers. They're not necessarily wanting to develop a new technology, but they want to implement that technology so that they can utilize and extract more value from the various streams that they're generating. And so that's the space where I feel like there's an opportunity for more investment and support. Those who don't necessarily want to change their business model entirely, but expand it to, uh, to provide more products into the market. Is there something that our government or perhaps our private uh, financing partners could be doing to better support SMEs as they look to adopt technology? Yeah, I think... By understanding what it takes to implement these technologies, because once again, we're, we're, we're somewhat developing a new value chain. We're trying to take organic waste streams in this example and direct those into industries which may not currently be utilizing those. And so that may actually require new business models to come in and fill in the gaps within those value chains. How can we process on site, pre-treat organic waste so that it can be transported longer distances into a commodity feedstock, either locally or globally? Uh, the challenge with organic waste streams is that they can rot, they're biologically active. So we need to find ways to convert that so that it doesn't um, become unusable when it reaches its destination. 
Do you mind if I add? Oh, not at all. On that, which it would completely agree, and I think a lot of the traditional funding model has focused on earlier stage, very disruptive companies that have a, a, a incredible growth potential and profile, where there has been less focus, and, and a gap we're trying to fill is for slightly more mid-stage companies, so Canada we call them SMEs, but you know, mid-market size businesses that may be adopting technologies. And, and we see them doing that in response to probably three main challenges from a sustainability perspective. There's, there's certainly a, a food security and kind of resilience perspective that is often being addressed. There is a resource efficiency element where we're, everyone is trying and we, we all recognize we need to do more with less within the food system. But the, the third pillar where we've got a couple really interesting examples recently have been companies innovating around decarbonization. And there they are looking to replace maybe existing technology that would be gas powered or have um, legacy efficiency challenges with new electrified uh, cooking, roasting, processing technology that has a fabulous business case to it. It ends up reducing food waste within their system. It makes them more efficient and ultimately more profitable, but at the same time has a really quantifiable impact from a sustainability perspective. And trying to marry those two, we see solutions maybe at the very large cap size where there isn't, is translating that to this sort of mid-market. I think um, what 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 we look for when we enter because um, uh, we're US we're a US uh, entity and we set up a subsidiary in Canada. What we look for from a government perspective is that there is alignment between the ag ministry and the innovation ministry. Um, unless your ag uh, ministry is thinking about innovation, it's not going to be an attractive place for us to um, uh, position ourselves, and it has to be a national agenda. Agriculture and food is an eight trillion dollar industry, and in twenty five years, it's going to be a twelve trillion dollar industry. You can't definitively say that about many other industries, that it's going to grow at that, at that scale. What I would also say is, and I can say this because I'm not, I'm not from Canada, as you could probably tell, um, there needs to be a cohesive approach um, as part of the national agenda. What we find is, as an organization raising capital here and deploying capital here is that the, the, the provincial... Um, pro I think they call it a collaboration. So like when we go raise money, we go to, you know, like Alberta Enterprise Corporation, Ontario Growth, um, Investment Quebec. Um, and each of these organizations have their own set uh, rules and standards around where capital is deployed, where a fund manager eats his cornflakes on a Monday morning. Um, so it's 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 very dip because a fund predominantly needs to needs to focus on returns um, and needs to focus on quality companies. It can't focus on geography. So a more national cohesive approach for funders, I think, is something that we would like to see. It would make our lives a hell of a lot easier. I don't know if it's gonna if it's gonna if it's gonna happen, but I think cohesion um, and having a part of the of not just the ag agenda but the innovation agenda um, is something that I think can help progress it. Mm -hmm. I wonder in terms of technologies that you're all seeing if you can highlight a few areas uh, that are really exciting to you. I know we've I know <laughs> that we've got a real fan of food waste or eliminating food waste on the panel, but are there other areas that are particularly exciting to your respective organizations? Uh, Craig, I'll start with you. Sure. One, one where we're really excited about that has a huge impact is around localization of food supply chains and food manufacturing. And that takes a few forms, but one that comes to mind is, is a company called Goodleaf, which we invested in uh, li late last year. Goodleaf is a vertical farm. They grow leafy greens and microgreens in drawers in a controlled environment that lets them do that with a 90% less water on 95% less land and within miles versus days of their customers. So it's a huge, uh, huge competitive advantage. That's an industry that is also really capital intensive. And the business model there required capital and required support to continue to expand their footprint. So today they produce product in Guelph, Ontario for this market uh, in and around the GTA. But in order to be able to support retailers across the country are building new farms in Calgary, Alberta, and in Montreal, Quebec. So a really um, unique story where their approach to growth is entirely food first. 
So though there's a real technology component, they're solving a very real challenge for their customers who are retailers who have seen spikes in lettuce prices and availability and uh, for for People in the local market will remember there was a period at the end of last year where a head of romaine lettuce was $15 and you couldn't get it on your hamburgers and, you know, Subway didn't have it on their subs. And I, I think we've seen over the last two years uh, and, and through the pandemic, just the vulnerability of our supply chains. So there's a huge opportunity to bring capital to uh, innovative businesses to build a much more robust and resilient local supply chain. Yeah, to follow up on that, I guess it's not maybe a different way of thinking about technology, but for me, I'm really excited about new business models, collaborative business models, which will allow uh, uh, farmers, for example, in the same region to be able to collaborate and utilize their waste streams together. One of the biggest challenges of directing waste uh, into different mo commodity markets is that there's a seasonal fluctuate fluctuations and other types of uh, fluctuations within that landscape. So if we can come together and build collaborative models and find investment to support a large number of these businesses to actually work together and find that value together, I think that's a really great innovation. Mm. Yeah, uh, from our perspective and leaning on from what Mr. Hanna was saying is like, Canada um, imports about 80% of its fresh food and veg. Um, and the I think about 50% of that is imported from the US. So if you can imagine then Canadians spend a hell of a lot more on that, on that produce than, than um, US citizens do. So the idea that we can um, grow uh, some of our leafy greens or some fruit and veg indoors in a country that really doesn't have the climate to do it um, serves as a big opportunity. Um, the problem, I guess, recently with control environment agriculture and vertical farming is, is that energy costs have, have, have really played a, a big factor. I think we saw that um, with some of the cuts um, of Infarm across um, the GTA. I was uh, speaking to a vertical farm in the Netherlands uh, uh, not too long ago, and they said it's more cost effective for them to turn off the lights and take the sacrifice on the yield uh, at night than to leave the lights on at night, uh, which is really highlights a problem point in, in that area. We really are, are strong on, on, on uh, vertical farming. We work with an organization called Plenty in the United States, but I think some innovation around um, um, how the energy is flowed in, into there is going to be um, an important area of focus. Uh, going forward, but not only does that industry solve a, a produce uh, problem, a supply chain problem, one of Plenty's latest facilities was close to, was in uh, downtown LA near Compton uh, in a high rise. So it also solves a real estate problem, um, which many major cities are, are, are looking at right now. So we're really strong in that, but obviously anything else that can completely reimagine um, how we feed, fuel and clothe us, precision fermentation, cellular agriculture, um, all really exciting areas for us to invest in and support. Mm -hmm. So uh, perhaps to take us on a bit of a different track, but still focused on Canada, um, you know, how do we help the food sector learn about and educate themselves about some of these evolving technologies? Uh, Craig, you mentioned the food sector is chronically underinvested. I've heard others say it's 70 years behind in terms of technology adoption, and that's from companies trying to sell technology to a food processor. So if we're going to develop these new green technologies and help these companies get to market, we need to help them find Canadian customers. Who owns this responsibility of educating food processors or farmers, um, you know, about uh, what's coming out, but also how do we educate these technology developers that we're dealing with a, a customer base that is perhaps not overly always so sophisticated. I don't, I don't want to make that a sweeping comment, but also operating with very limited profitability and budgets. So who, who, who needs to be leading that? Is it on all of us? It's uh, operating a food company is really hard. Like you, these are t businesses that are doing something that's really important every single day and there is not a mar big margin for error. And as we look at the adoption of new technology, I think there's a lot of 
challenges that can can be encountered in convincing someone to make a change. And if you look at agricultural production at, at one end of the value chain, to convince a farmer to adopt a, a new practice that may put at risk a crop that only comes once a year is really challenging. And the, the cycle there we've seen be quite long. Further, as I get closer to the consumer, I think that cycle can be faster. So one of our theses around why we need to play across the value chain is that being able to connect consumer-driven insights across the value chain all the way back to how food's being produced and helping tell the story of how that food's being produced more sustainably to a consumer will ultimately be really valuable and is impactful, but it's not an overnight component or, or, or success factor. It is something that we think uh, there's a lot of stakeholders that will have to be coordinated in helping bring that together. Yeah, I really like this idea of telling the story to showcase the value. Um, we do a lot of knowledge mobilization through our organization, seeking to provide that information. What technology is available? What types of products can you actually create? Or what types of products could be created if you were able to find the right um, purchaser of your commodity feedstock? Really understanding wh where are those new markets? How can you access them? Um, is there funding available? Uh, so things like uh, the trade, um, you know, uh, international trade or, uh, organizations and things like that. I really think it's a collaborative effort, to be honest. Um, there is people who are developing technologies who need to find those marketplaces uh, and those who are wanting to figure out what technologies they can utilize. And so I think I also want to shout out CFIN because you do a lot of work as well, mobilizing that knowledge and information too, and also Thrive. Um, there's, I think, one of the models, I, I might, might be stepping on the toes, but I really like the Thrive model because you're really supporting those innovators throughout those steps. You're bringing in those different stakeholders. And that's, I think, what we really need and seeing more models like that being replicated um, across jurisdictions, across industries as well, would be really beneficial in the long term. Thank you. I agree with that. <laughs> um, yeah, we did. We speak about adoption in our company, I think, probably every week. Um, we partnered with the United Farmers of Alberta, who represent about 100,000 farmers across Western Canada uh, a couple of years ago. And we did an adoption uh, survey to really understand the customer, which ultimately, if you want adoption, you have to understand the customer. And a couple of things came out of that report. Number one is, and I believe they spoke about it on the panel, so apologies, if you can prove if you can show return on investment, normally adoption uh, will come. Um, what I would say from a, a, a farmer's perspective is that, you know, they're, they're the ones that are taking on the risk for new technologies. So, um, and by what I mean by that, if it doesn't work out, they're obviously going to absorb the cost. So anything that government could do to... Um, um, to make that risk a little less risky um, would be very helpful uh, uh, to the industry overall. But what I would say a critical part of this is, is that many of our the, the customers that, that we deal with it, um, they don't have the expertise to adopt the technology. So it's not about them not wanting to adopt it. They need to have the, the capabilities or else the employees to be able to adopt that um, um, technology enter the likes of Upskills Canada, hugely important entity. I hope people, someone from, from that organization is here today, um, but they should be really ingrained in the agriculture industry because um, if you've read the Climate Ac Action Institute report for more BC, in 2033, this industry is going to be in, um, hitting one of the biggest labor crises that we've ever seen. Um, and innovation and investment in technology is hopefully going to solve that, um, but we need to have upskills and we need to have um, we need to have some policy attractive policy that's going to allow allow the customer ultimately to adopt it in a cost effective way mm -hmm. I've heard the capacity challenge time and time again specifically related to adopting automation and robotics companies are engaging in piecemeal projects as opposed to true manufacturing or operational transformation because they lack the resources to truly undertake that. So they're always building an airplane while flying it, never actually getting a true capacity increase. They're just putting out fires. Um, 
it, I'll put this one to Lovesi. Just as a you know, a consultant in bioeconomy, are you finding that firms are actually making sustainability a centerpiece of their organization now, or is this still secondary to other business goals? I definitely think. Well, it really depends on the business, I guess, at the end of the day. There's certainly uh, organizations that are seeking to center sustainability. Um, but what we see from the larger organizations is that we have to see a clear return on investment, uh, as well as that being coupled with a... Um, a a regulatory landscape in which the, those uh, those innovations will actually be able to survive and thrive within. For the SMEs, I think smaller businesses are generally more sustainable. They're, they're more connected to their communities and directly see the value of incorporating green technologies. But once again, it just becomes very challenging, that capacity that they have, which is why you know I'm here as a consultant, they need to be able to understand what technologies are available and how to implement those. So a lot of what we do at the Waste Labs is similar to what energy, of, energy advisors do for green buildings, going into a building and saying, here is all the things you can do to uh, make your building more eff effective. We're building frameworks in which we can go into businesses and saying, here is all the things you can do with your waste streams. Um, some of them may be currently a low TRL, um, but being able to understand where you can currently direct your waste, if that's um, a, an agricultural supplement or a bioenergy facility, um, and where eventually you might be able to go to get uh, continue to get higher value from your waste streams. And so I think it's there's definitely a desire to want to tie into these different um, into these different opportunities, but it's really about where does the capacity come from, where does the funding come from, and how can we make it easy um, for for businesses to be able to do that transition. We're running into the same problems over and over again, aren't we? Yeah. One of the questions we had as we were starting out from from institutions maybe who had less familiarity with the food value chain as an investable area often ask that question of does, does sustainability matter to these companies? Like how hard will it be to convince the CEO of a business or the founder of a company that sustainability matters? We've, we've had hundreds of conversations over the last two years that has never come up once. Like if you are in this industry, you appreciate it. You are living it every day. It isn't always the center of how they go to market and how they communicate today, but it is a very real challenge within the industry. What we're excited about are some of the businesses that are not, you know, I, I think on the one extreme, there's rampant greenwashing and we're all aware of the, you know, how, how just much that detracts from the credibility of the efforts that some folks are doing. On the other end of the continuum, we're really excited about companies that are measuring that impact they're having. They are quantifying the pounds of food waste that they are redirecting. They are measuring the CO2 intensity of their manufacturing. They are looking at where their energy source is coming from. And showing an improvement on that is becoming more and more relevant to the stakeholders and the customers of those businesses. And we, we had a great example in, in one business that we, right after we invested, we're able to take a lot of the data that we spent and we're, we're really, you know, we're investors. We're, we ask a lot of questions. We do a lot of analysis. We quantify everything. We were able to then take that and translate it into a customer presentation for that company that they then used with a large global customer to prove the point about the benefits of their solution versus another. And that was hugely impactful and really rewarding for us as investors to be able to connect the dots between those two and show that sustainability, it's not an added cost, it's actually an enabler of commercial growth and success. I think, I think for us, we've had to be, uh, we've had to do a big uh, fact checking exercise. I think a lot of uh, startups that we deal with, um, I'll give you one example of one day we went through about maybe like a hundred decks. And within those decks, we found out that a third of our food was lost on the farm. A third of our food was lost in transit and a third of our food was lost in restaurants and households. So if you were to believe all that, uh, there's no food left. So um, we've had to do a lot of fact checking exercises. There's a, there's a good bit of that in the industry because obviously it's a hugely important area. So what I would say to, to startups out there is that we, we've had to really dig deep in terms of our are these solutions actually solving the problems that they're identifying? Because a lot of them are, are using some information that actually may not necessarily be through, uh, which is this industry gets um, 
a very bad rep globally. Farmers get a bad, uh, a, a bad rep globally. And in my opinion, there's no other oc occupation that treats the soil as precious as farmers do. Um, so yeah, fact check what you're doing is ultimately what, what, what we'd say. It's funny. I was going to ask you both how you approach due diligence, and I think you you answered it. I I like your comments around um, at CFIN. We we run grant programs and calls for applications, and often ask companies to detail a competitive landscape or what their potential valuation is. We're often dealing with early stage companies as well, and we'll see something like my this market's worth ten billion, and I if I capture one percent, I'm going to be you know that's what I'm going to do. And it's it's um, it's we're not doing ourselves any favors um, with that data. So uh, often competitive intelligence and strong market research is missing if, uh, from early stage companies. Uh, maybe the larger firms are a bit better at it because they've got a true balance sheet and and a stronger financial capability to do that analysis. One of the the realities is for people running a company like this. It's not easy to quantify all of these things and track these. And if you've got to choose between, you know, building building technology, spending time with a customer, making sure you've got money for payroll, and or or you know, writing an ESG report, you, you kind of understandably realize why maybe it falls to the bottom of the pile. And it's something that we as you know investors need to be able to support and make that easier. Uh, but, but something you mentioned just around solutions it really resonated. And we've been really impressed with some companies that are developing technology that has a great sustainability benefit. Otherwise, we're not there. It has a great financial benefit, but solves real problems within an industry or for a certain type of manufacturer or farmer within those businesses. And quite oftentimes, we're seeing that come from within the industry. These are people that are not there to disrupt how things are doing. They've lived with those challenges and they recognize there's maybe a better way and step back and, and have created wonderful innovation. Uh, for us, from a diligence perspective, validating the problem that's being solved for customers, how big that problem is, and making sure, as you mentioned, that there's an ROI associated with the technology or the approach to solving it is is a real really important part of the equation as we think about what's going to actually scale and grow i assume that's a lot of the work that you're doing too lovis like around helping companies truly understand what the return is on some of these challenges that they're facing either with waste products or sustainable packaging things like that Yes, definitely. I mean, that's the key thing which is going to lead into the ROI and the, and the value that's created from these different technologies. I think one of the challenges, though, as well as that is there's not necessarily standardized metrics for measuring the impact of these different technologies at the moment. So it's a little bit of a kind of a guesstimate <laughs> often it ends up being. And so it's also about how can we tie in the value of these um, into the conversation or the story that's currently being told around ESG and other types of metrics that we're using. And that takes a little bit more finessing. But some of the things like um, accounting for the mass of material that you're diverting from the landfill, the uh, GHGs associated with the transportation when you localize um, your different processes, those are avenues in which that we can showcase the value of different technologies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for us, um, we actually don't look at the technology first. Our first metric is the team. Um, so we'll invest in, in an A team with a B product rather than an A product with a B team because an A team will always figure it out. Um, what we try and do as part of our, our corporate engagement is we'll bring in our corporates to help validate our investments. Um, so I'll give you a, a most recent Canadian in, uh, investment we did uh, two months ago, a company called One Cup AI. Uh, they use AI technology to, to monitor cow behavior, which normally is done by, by, by a human. Um, and we consulted with the United Farmers of Alberta as part of that investment. They're ultimately the customer. And through that process, uh, UFA, United Farmers of Alberta, made their first ever investment um, in a, their, a farming cooperative. So new strategy, major validation point for us. So um, we ultimately uh, went ahead with the investment. So we, we, we know that we don't know everything. So we bring a lot of our corporate partners to help validate um, the investment. And when you can do it from a, um, not just a corporate side, but a customer side as well, um, it gives us a lot of confidence that um, the 
will be adoption there because we're at a an earlier stage. So we take um, there's a bit more uh, risk there. Um, but when you can ultimately validate some of that, it it helps the process along. So that's part of our diligence. Mm -hmm. Uh, for Craig and John, when you're working with companies, because I'm sensitive now, we're getting close for time, so I want to shift to more global opportunity. Are you encouraging your companies to look to Canada first, or is it about global opportunities um, for their products? The, the challenges that our, our companies are solving are not unique to Canada. The, the, and, and for many of them, their supply chains run around the world, sometimes a few times. So we think, um, at, usually at the scale that we're in size, we're getting involved in, there are often opportunities outside of the borders of Canada. Uh, that, that likely is a factor of the size and stage of company that we may be investing in. I think developing local traction and, uh, proof points, I don't know, John, your perspective, sometimes working with someone that you can be very close to is hugely advantageous. And we've seen that by the time we're getting involved, oftentimes the, the initial customers have been quite close by and yeah. allows for that sort of really intimate working relationship. Yeah. We, we obviously originally were positioning, let's say, some of our companies outside of North America uh, to, to set up there just because from an access to capital perspective. Um, as we started to grow in Canada, a lot of the investments we made and entrepreneurs we deal with, they never really thought about Canada as a, as a region that they could set up in. Um, one uh, organization uh, we invested in in, uh, in Chile, um, they thought about setting up in New York to be you know closer to, uh, to the US, but they were really wanted access to, to, to the valley, so it's more more capital, and they ultimately started thinking about. We brought them to Calgary to see to see what uh, what they thought of it, and they were expecting to get on a flight from 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 San Francisco, and they were expecting to be ten hours when it was only about two hours and fifteen minutes. They didn't realize, and it ultimately opened a. Uh, it opened the scope in terms of uh, um, our advice to them and where they can set up. To be honest, yeah, we've actually shifted more um, to recommending companies set up in Canada um, because we are of the opinion that um, Canada are quite good, particularly at that earlier stage in terms of funding research. Um, so while capital and available capital um, um, can focus on the US as well, um, to set up a company and get access to, to the Canadian market, but the US market, we are probably Canada number one right now. Um, and I keep getting, uh, you know, in terms of like, like what, I think you asked what Canada can do as well in terms of, uh, um, you know, making sure that, can, you know, Canada's economy stays sustainable. I mentioned this uh, a couple of weeks ago at an event and I got really heavily criticized uh, for it, so I'm gonna say it again. Um, we, I mean, I'm, and I don't like plugging my home country, but I'm going to do it. So there's an organization, a uh, government organization in, um, in Ireland called, called Enterprise Ireland, um, who are a very similar entity to, uh, to EDC. Uh, we help companies export, Irish homegrown companies export to international markets. They ultimately uh, do grant funding, um, but they ask for equity in return. So what has happened is, is that Enterprise Ireland are now the second biggest venture capitalists in Europe, not in Ireland, in Europe. They're the most active venture capitalists in the last four years in, in Europe. Their terms are very, very good, obviously, as a government agency. And I, I mentioned this, and maybe that could be a strategy for, uh, uh, for Canada. Imagine if, if EDC or one of these organizations were the second largest venture capitalist in North America, what that would do for the Canadian economy. I'll let that sit with you. No, it's not going to happen, but sometimes it's, uh, it's good to learn from other countries as well. I think Israel and Netherlands do innovation very, very well. Um, um, but Canada needs to be a leader. So how you're a leader is you've got to set the tone to how other people um, follow you. So... Um, Canada needs to be a leader. It needs, it needs to work. We have the land space. We have the people. We have some great universities, third level institutions. Guelph down the road is, you know, globally known. The Old College Smart Farm in Alberta is known across Europe, across Australia. Not many Canadians know that, but it is. Um, so yeah, I'd be very optimistic of, of, um, about Canada and, and attracting companies here. To, to build on that, we would love it if you bring them here and we'll try and keep them here with capital to continue growing. And I think that's something that historically we have not done a great job of as a country. So yep. making sure that we have the, the capital and the ecosystem to support those businesses once they are successful and tra have traction and are growing 
uh, is a huge opportunity. And outside of money, what could we do, you know, learning from international markets? Is there, are there uh, regulatory or other innovation supports that we can give to uh, companies looking to innovate here, Lovese? Yeah, definitely. I feel like investment and uh, regulation go hand in hand when wanting to truly turn inventions into innovations. And I think we heard from uh, previous panels early in, in, early in the day, if if businesses are going to invest in these types of technologies, but the regulatory landscape changes or isn't necessarily there, then where where is that investment going? You're not going to actually get your return on that investment to start off with. And so what I really would what the difference I, that I see between, for example, EU, the EU and Canada is that we do have funding coupled with a supportive uh, regulatory framework. And there's organizations like um, Biomac, which is a really interesting um, um, program that's happening in the EU at the moment where they're coupling, uh, they're coupling the research and piloting with the market uptake, with the, um, the requirements for um, the value chain and validation. So coupling all of the things that are truly needed to take a innovation into the marketplace. And so I see a lot of opportunities when it comes to the, regula the regulations here in Canada. Um, I primarily kind of look towards plastics um, when I'm thinking about the biomaterials and the people that we're working with today. Um, how can we move past just this idea of recycling conventional plastics to potentially having things like a renewable content limit in our material so we can create that market pull and actually create that landscape in where waste streams can be turned into commodities that can then turn be back into products again. And so also, how can we support things like sustainable procurement uh, so that businesses are seeking out those different types of new products? I think we need to have that regulatory um, de define where our regulatory sandbox is so that innovation can happen within that. Uh, without that, there's, it's, there's so much risk associated with going down these different pathways, which makes businesses and investors not really want to necessarily do those types of things. So Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're coming to the end of our time, so I'll say thank you for a wide-ranging and very easy-flowing conversation, and thank you to the Toronto Global Forum for having us and letting us profile how important we think food and agriculture is to all of you today.